excited to see something on urban prairies because after having dealt with a real urban prairie, and in our case, a primitive prairie, I've learned one thing, and that is get all the help you can, get all the opinions you can, because whatever your preconceived notions were about what's going to work and what isn't, is probably going to change. And so you have to be kind of flexible to manage these prairies. Ours offers a challenge that probably is a little different from a lot of the other ones that we've been talking about because we are remnant, meaning this is the original prairie that was there thousands of years ago. And uh, maintaining an original prairie in an extremely urbanized setting can be very difficult. We have over 340 species there. Many of them are rare. We don't have the endangered, but a lot of them are rare species. And so uh, one of the things that we realized after we inherited this was that everybody has a special interest. Some people want to protect the orchids. Some people want to protect the birds and so forth and so on. And so every time we come up with an idea of how we're going to do something, somebody says, wait a minute, what about the birds nesting out there? It's going to mess those up. So you have to, that's why I said you really have to be real flexible in trying to coordinate your plans with all the different groups that are interested in different species that are out there. Um, we have, I think, been able to do it fairly well, uh, but that's one of the challenges that we face in doing this. We're about five miles from the ship channel. We, uh, in, in Deer Park, this is a city location. Can you go ahead and change the slide? Okay, so this is a, a couple of Google Maps just to give you some perspective about how urbanized we really are. Uh, these are housing developments on either side. This is the prairie right here. We have housing developments on both sides, some old, some new. We have a, a school right there, which is on the corner of our property. And we have a cemetery on the other side of the major highway right next to it. So when we say we're an urban prairie, yeah, we're right in the heart of the city of Deer Park. Uh, many, many people live there, all the industrial complex is there with the chemicals and the, you know, the petrol uh, industry and so forth. So that makes uh, an added uh, burden of trying to work with all that and keep that prairie protected. I will tell you there are those people that are out there, in fact I talked to one just the other day about their signs from A&M and um, we probably won't be able to maintain this prairie forever that it's going to be lost. So I said, well, you know, it's the, the verdict's not out yet. We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. And that's what I would say with all of these restorations that you all are working with and all the prairies that you're working with. You know, we're at the forefront of all the knowledge that we're acquiring right now, and it's going to be really, really important. So I hope all of you are keeping records of what you're doing and how you're doing it, because in order to, to make sure that these things are still around later on, we're going to have to be open to new ideas, we're going to have to be innovative, and we're going to have to find new ways to do something. I think we can do it. So uh, the other pictures there are just some of the various um, people out working on the prairie. And really, the important thing about these prairies is that people and prairies go together. We could not do any of this without the people who come out and volunteer. And I'm sure you all have found that to be true as well. And by the way, if any of you know any volunteers looking for a place to come, <laughs> we're happy to, to we ever turn anybody down. We take Boy Scouts, we take college students, high school students. We, we're happy for anybody who wants to come out and volunteer. And Land, by the way, uh, is our coordinator for everything that we do out there. So she's, um, yeah, she'll find you something to do, I promise. Uh, so one of the big issues that uh, we face besides making sure that we have enough volunteers is the actual, maintaining the actual disturbance regime for the prairie because that's what keeps a prairie a prairie. Uh, and of course, we, the number one thing that is done is to burn, but we haven't been allowed yet. We haven't given up. I'm already trying to talk to people and throw that seed out there like, hey, wouldn't it be interesting if the fire department could come and practice? <laughs> on our property right here in case there was a grass fire in Deer Park. We haven't accomplished that yet, but we're working on it. Uh, they did a burn at San Jacinto uh, Monument, 
and uh, I've been talking to uh, Andy Sippets, who's the Parks and Wildlife there that manages those prairies, and he, he gave me some hints on how we might possibly in the future be able to accomplish that. So I would just say, if you think you're in an area you can't burn, don't give up, because there are urban areas in Texas right now, in Austin, where they have an urban, I don't remember the exact name, but they're out there burning right in the urban area, right next to houses. And so it can be done, but uh, it just takes a while to get to that point. So I, I was asked to list the challenges. There were so many, my list kept growing. <laughs> So I thought, okay, they're categorizing them, that, that's too many problems. Uh, but there are a lot of problems, and I, I think one of the big ones for us, of course, is the invasives that we have. Uh, I, wouldn't, I don't know that it's more important than others, but if you don't do something about them, they take over your prairie, whether you have a restoration, and in our case, a remnant. And we had many invasives out there before we ever got the property. So the first thing we had to do was attack the uh, woody species that were growing out there. Of course, the two worst ones, Bacchus and Chinese tallow, to the point where we actually used some of our funds that we had raised to bring a crew in and attack <laughs> some of those last stands of Bacchus out there. We're still not done. We, it's just an ongoing thing. Uh, another thing that we discovered that has been a real challenge to us is the weather because this is a wet prairie, it has a lot of sinkholes in it, and one of the things we needed to do was get big equipment out there to either shred it, mow it, or hay it, or whatever. So last year, uh, we, were, we kept checking it, everything it looked dry. Okay, good, we can go, we can do this now. We've been out walking around. The guy comes out with his big tractors. What happens? He gets out just a little way, immediately sinks about this deep into our prairie, so not so good. Uh, and the reason, <laughs> the reason why is because uh, it's, it's hard to dry up what's considered a wet prairie. So those are some of the problems that we have. Um, getting enough volunteers out there, finding the equipment that we need, the funding, and so forth. So as I said, our management team uh, works with us on that. Plus, uh, we have a team uh, from HNPAT that also helps us and land coordinates all of that. Uh, all right, Pat, that's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have two hours of problems, we know. <laughs> 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 yes. You said that someone recently told you that you wouldn't be able to sustain this prairie. Could you follow up about why, what he was getting at specifically? What well, one of the is? reasons, particularly for this one, but it could apply to others, is that you're essentially an island in a sea that is completely different around it. And you're constantly being bombarded with invasives. Uh, other factors that may not even be known, uh, pollutants that are in the air. For instance, one of the things that we've noticed at Deer Park is we have a lack of certain insect groups. I mean, we have them, but they're not the numbers we would expect. And we've been trying to figure out why, and we're assuming that it's some, you know, some kind of factor that's impacting us from the surrounding area. We don't really know for sure. So that's the thinking there, and there's a genetic situation that's involved there too, because it's called the island effect whenever you uh, have an area that's isolated, because essentially it's sort of like being in an ocean, and the, that prairie remnant is your island. Well, what happens to the genetics of that site? And it's a big question for us too, in terms of uh, you know, do we introduce any species, or, or you know, how does any, how is there any interchange of genetic material in and out of those areas? So it's questions like that that make people think that they may not exist. I, again, like I said, I think the jury's out. I don't think there we know the answer to that yet. Yeah. Have any of the Yeah, have any of the residents of the nearby communities been inspired to use prairies in their landscaping? Well, we're starting on that. Uh, one of the things that's happened just within the last few months is that we received a grant from Shell Corporation for an educator position there. We've had one before, but this one will actually be an outreach one where we go out into the community as opposed to waiting for people to come to us. We go out, we'll be out in the classrooms, in the universities, and part of that program is to 
uh, introduce the community to native plants and using native plants. We have a native plant demonstration garden right there on the property. All of the plants in that garden are from the prairie right next to it, so we can show how you can use those things. And we think that's going to be a really important aspect of it. Yeah. Have you reached out to the Sanjak community? Yes. Yes, we have an agreement with them, particularly with their uh, science department. They've already had uh, several classes come over. They're not usually large groups because we can't accommodate real large groups. We don't have busloads of students coming yet. Eventually we will, but not yet. And um, they come and they do projects, like a class project, or they volunteer or whatever. Is there any interest in them doing their topic prairie on campus? Well, we're going to approach, that's, that's one of the things that, that's on the to-do list for our new educator position. Yes. Yeah. Could you talk about some of your community events? I know you've had events where you come out and collect insects at night. Or could you talk a little bit about that and plans to expand that for public? Well, once we, again, once we have this educator position, I think you're going to see that those things are going to expand considerably because we now are working with the Chamber of Commerce. They're really excited about it because they suddenly realize that, hey, this is something we can brag about. And so now they're real interested in us doing lots of programs and so forth. And so uh, you will see a lot more of that in the future. We haven't done as much in the past because uh, one, our number one priority was making sure we were taking care of the prairie. Uh, but now we're kind of in phase two where we're doing, starting all the outreach. Yeah, I want to add one thing is anybody who wants to visit can come on our regular work days, which is second Wednesday and fourth Saturdays because um, there will be some in the mornings because there will be somebody over there. Usually it's not man, but, usually, but on the work days there will be somebody over there and all you have to do is sign a liability release and you're welcome to walk. I also wanted to mention, uh, this, this hadn't been mentioned yet, but Lan Shen right over here uh, is kind of a glue in the prairie community manages and puts out monthly what's called the up team um, update up team is urban prairie team our goal is to build kind of a cadre of people who go from site to site they're not audubon folks they're not our folks they're not maybe uh NPAT folks they're just folks who are interested in urban prairie conservation they might latch on with one of the groups and just stay there but in order to help each other we actually list all the urban projects that are coming up in the next month so if you have a project that's urban kind of grassland related, you can let Lan know and she can put it on that list and we can try to drum up some support for getting some volunteers. All right, those five minutes. Now we need to talk. It's <laughs> 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 Next day. <laughs> That's what my, my question, how did you engage the homeowners? Yeah, I think that was kind of, and what percentage of the homeowners 
uh, like came to your events? Well, I think that was the advantage of that project, that it was all kind of happening at the same time, and that they were all part of this one big development. Um, so I could see how it would be a little bit more tricky if there's separate And how many, what percentage of the homeowners in the area came to, say, your work days or your uh, events? Oh, that's a good question. Well, it was, you know, the development was very big, like the HEV, and so it happened in incremental phases. But um, some of the first houses, I don't know. space. 